Hello Tank fans and welcome to episode 18 of the Totally Tanked podcast. I'm Rob and I'm here with... John, hello everybody. Good to have you back in the... Could have us back in your ears, I guess. And in particular in your ears, regular listeners might have noticed we had a new theme music or a modified theme music, I should say. Normally the wonderful Luke McGrath's uh, theme is um, what we uh, play at the start of this podcast. Uh, but this time, listener Etienne Chartrand um, has created an alternate version, two alternate versions. You had one at the start and there'll be a slightly different one at the end. So thanks very much, Etienne, for uh, sending that through. It really is nice to know that we're reaching people in different ways all over the world. Uh, and our ongoing thanks, obviously, to Luke McGrath, the original composer, whose version will be back in future episodes. Uh, Rob, what tank are we talking about today? We're talking about the M60. The, it's not the it's not the pattern. It's, it's just, not a pattern. It's <laughs> U.S. Army General Gun Transport System, something rather, something rather M60. Yeah, so, it, it's quite weird because American tanks traditionally do have names. Well, there is some so discussion. There is some, tanks there is some, some discussion about that, yeah. whether or not they were actually were named, especially during the Second World War, mm-hmm. uh, or they were just called the M10 rather than the Wolverine or mm-hmm. whatever else, or the Sherman. Is mm-hmm. uh, one of the uh, rumors going around is that Churchill couldn't tell the uh, tanks apart, so uh, they said, right, call this one this one, and that that one's a Jackson, that one's a Wolverine, and that's a uh, Sherman, and th- that was one of the reasons why he was calling. And then the British were calling, giving their own names to the American tanks that they were using. Yeah, which is so, where you get the Grant Lee issue. But yep, yeah. Yeah, and all those sort of things. And you're not allowed to put general in front of them because that might confuse you with a tank with a general in it. Yes, or a general with a whose actual name is Grant. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, and, so, and also and also I don't think Churchill is the only one who gets confused by endless um, letter and number designations. I think I think it's quite normal for any human being, even people who work in the military to not know exactly what the difference between an M14 and an M16 is, but they totally know the difference between, say, a Sherman or a Grant. It, um, you know, words have meanings to us that numbers don't. Mm. Uh, anyway, definitely it is not a pattern. Wargaming keep calling, keeps calling a pattern. It must drive the chief to nuts that his videos <laughs> have got pattern written on the supers. Um, and um, uh, War Thunder co- insist on calling it a pattern. Um, so I reckon something like two thirds of the YouTube videos that I looked at while researching mm. this episode, uh, called it a pattern. Yep. M60 pattern when it's not. Yeah. So none of the, they are none, wrong. Of, none of the we are documentation right. says it's caused it a pattern. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was a, uh, one of the first MBTs, main battle tanks. So where is the, the- first American MBT and the last steel hull tank ever built. It's quite yes. weird that those two things would- but also, also the first with the ERA, with the explosive reactive armor. That's the Israeli version. Oh, no, the Americans brought it out in 83 okay, as well. Sure. So, but, uh, they. Now, do you want to talk about the Hungarian uprising, John, and how all this came about? I feel the story of the M60's development is incomplete without the greatest moment in tanky history. Mm, I think um, so. The, uh, the Russian invasion of. Uh, it was Hungary, wasn't it? Uh, the Hungarian uprising, it was. But yeah, yeah so the Hungarian it's... uprising, and then the Russians invaded. Mm. Um, Said, which... back in your place, you're, you're, you're communist now. Yeah, well, uh, and, and militant communists to this day still think that was actually a good thing, uh, while most. Folks in the West think it was a bad thing. Um, so most, back in, but not all, uh, folks is, in the West think it was a bad thing. And this thing. is in 56, so the Americans yeah. are at this stage driving around in their M47, M48 patterns. Yes, which had a... 90 mil gun. 90 mil gun and a road range of under 100 kilometres. I think it might have been 80 kilometres. Uh, sorry, miles. It would have been in miles. miles yeah. um, but still, terrible range. Hmm. Tiny little gun that was um, okay in 1945, but things have been moving very quickly. Yep. Russian tank driver drives his tank into the British embassy in Hungary. And says, I want to, uh, here's a tank for you to look at, and mm. uh, leaves it there. And then the uh, British uh, uh, military attaché has gone out and had a look at it, and they've uh, done all sorts of looking over of this Russian, new Russian tank, the T-55, and gone, um, the armor's a bit thick on this, and they got a big gun, and I don't think the tanks that we've got are going to be able to face this. Now, I do have there's some problems with this story. Because it's such a seminal story and it drove a huge part of tank development in the 20th century. It must have been a very experienced military attaché in Hungary for the whole military industrial complex. I'm sure one guy. One out guy's there. assessment. I'm sure somebody got out there pretty quick to get some. Got, they got some more out there pretty quick to, just to make sure. I believe they did end up handing the tank back to the Russians as well, um, but not before they'd had a look at it and gone, "Oh dear, these T55s are a lot better." Not to than mention if you're if. 
at a flashpoint like uh, that at the time, you probably would have somebody with good knowledge of uh, your tank, um, the tanks that you might see driving down the road. Uh, yeah, I know I, what the, what's going on, what's going past. I also have a suspicion that the uh, military industrial complex was very keen to take his word for it because it meant building a whole new generation yeah. of tanks and lots of money for them. So, so um, to get around to the actual story, because the Russians had the T-55 with with much bigger gun and good armour, and the West said, well, our tanks aren't going to cop- no, deal with that. We need to build a new tank to deal with it and a new gun. So that's where the 105 L7 gun came into um, came into use. And- now, we, 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 we groan about how every tank in the world these days is using the Rheinmetall um, 120. But in the 1950s, everyone in the tank world must have been groaning, oh, everyone's using the L7-105. Um, the R- British Royal Ordnance um, 105 was, was one of the great cannons of history. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the Rheinmetall 120 is taking, taken, literally taken its place. <laughs> um, but, uh, even, I mean, for the Americans to be willing to use someone else's gun, mm. it really had to be so much better than anything they could build. Yes, and they kept on using the British version quite a while, even though they, st- uh, but they started building their own. Yeah, but it was still to the design. Yeah, uh, yeah um, and a 105 gun, even in 1956, wasn't a huge tank gun. I mean, it was definitely no. adequate. Um, but this is where we get around to the first MBT. So we had previously mm. seen medium tanks running around the place, and they had your heavy tank, your super heavy tanks like the M103s mm. with the 122 uh, guns, mm. uh, 22 mil guns. Um, I still think the 103 is one of the prettiest tanks ever built as well. But, <laughs> <laughs> but the point being is that you had this uh, new tank, uh, the T-55 running around, and they wanted to be able to deal with that, so they needed to build their own tank, which brought about the development of the M60 uh, from 1957. It took a couple of years to build it, build up the development, and then they rolled it out in 1960. They were going to call it the M68, but they said, no, it's, we're getting it out this year, so we're going to call it the M60. And away they went into production and service in 63, so it wasn't too bad. And then it lingered in active use, even though it was really just supposed to be a stopgap tank until the Abrams arrived. But because of the delays with the Abrams development, it ended up being in use in American use. I think the last units were retired in 1997. 97, correct. Um, and it is still very much in use, active use in um, Turkey. There are lots and lots of videos Egypt, of being blown up Israel. in Syria. Uh, the Israeli ones are so heavily modified. Mm. I, I, I mean, it's a bit like they're, they're still technically running Centurions, but are they really Centurions? No. Um, and of course, um, the Taiwanese are hoping to repel the Chinese hordes with their um, ancient M60s as well. So it it kind of symbolised so much of American industry of the 1960s in that it's big and it's boxy. And if you were doing a concept design with a clean sheet, you probably wouldn't come up with a design like it because it carried over a lot of stuff from the M48, um, particularly the, all the crew layout and things like that. But it's got a very powerful, very reliable, very easy to maintain engine. Diesel uh, engine. Yeah. So they've changed out the petrol engine from the M48 and mm. gave, given a, a diesel engine. Much better range with 480 kilometres um, and 43 uh, mile, K, kph along the road. Yep. Um, bit, bit on the slow side, but... It yeah. was, underpowered. Okay. Uh, underpowered, wasn't great yeah. cross-country, but and, they, and, they could get around. And also, I mean, it's just such a high boxy design, mm. um, which makes you vulnerable, but also you have to armour all of that height, um, which... which Means you're adding a lot of weight without actually adding a lot of protection. Only fifty tons, so it was only actually two tons heavier than yeah. the fifty-five. M- by the time it got to the yeah. final, design. but it, was, it wasn't yeah. too much heavier than the M48, and though it had a bigger gun and more armor, it mm. still they still managed to do a lot with it. Um, roomier inside as well, so very spacious. It was a spacious tank, as they say. Yeah, which still, still wouldn't want to be a big person in there, but no, it does that. It does add to crew survivability, um, and it gives it has given it the capacity for adding upgrades, which have been part of its extraordinarily long life. Um, so that that was good things, but you know, all else being equal, you'd still rather be in a tank with a low um, silhouette than a um, yeah. Big that's boxy a one. really interesting point because the tanks you were it was expected to be facing was the T fifty fives, very low silhouette. Yeah. Now, and it was built as a Cold War deterrent and basically Cold War tank for to fight the Russians in mm. Western Europe. So why would they build this 
totally different design than the than the enemy and have a high profile and I guess city fighting and be able to see over walls. Well, I, I mean, one thing it, it excels at, um, even in you know games like World of Tanks where they've carried over those design elements, is you, it can sit on a ridge mm. and depress its gun a long way down. Um, and um, you know, be, be have the whole of the hull sheltered by the ridge, so it's firing mm. you know from a hull down position. Which, you know, the T fifty five turret is yeah super sexy, um, and you know that's carried through into the T seventy twos and T nineties. But it doesn't um, elevate or depress very much because there's nowhere for the breech block to go through the um, no. the roof of the tank. Uh, so, you know, and Centurion also very similarly had an incredibly good um, elevation and depression which, again, in, in combat turns out to be much more important than people think when we all talk about armour thickness and um, gun calibers. Mm. Um, but uh, it's it's one of those designs that you look at and you're like, oh, this isn't a very good, should, shouldn't be very good, but it, mm. it's actually done extremely well. <laughs> so, so, you know, the real-world usage of it is, be, which, you know, you can get into, is it the crew training... Um, it, it has been a very successful tank. You can't argue with that, despite the fact it's a high boxy design that no one would have clean sheeted. No. Now look, it's been in service over 60 years now. Um, you, obviously, not the ones rolled out off the production line back in 60, 1960 uh, mm. won't still be running around, but those running off the production uh, line in 1987, they are. They're mm. still going. They're still being refurbished. Um so it's had a long service life and still going to to this day. I would love to know what the oldest M60 still in service, how old that one actually is, because the Israeli ones could well be extremely uh, old. Oh, so so could the Iranian ones that the uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so back before the uh, Islamic Revolution of 1979, the Americans had provided uh, 150. M60s to the Shah and his government. So, and those then got taken over by the revolutionary uh, government. So they're still running around in service. And they did they did very well in what was a real peer conflict um, against the uh, Iraqi um, T-72s. Um, mm. Now, obviously, for the Americans, the um, the big one was the hundred hours of. Um, the hundred hours of Desert Storm, where uh, I think it was two Marine battalions with M60s uh, tore around the place pretty much as if they were driving Abramses um, and um, destroyed a uh, a great number of uh, Iraqi armored vehicles, including a lot of T72s. Now, of course, I just want to give a shout out to the Marines because every time the U.S. Army gets a new tank, mm-hmm. they hand their old ones off to the Marines and say, "Here you go. You can have run around with these for a while, and we'll ha- drive around with the new stuff." You yeah, know. even to the point of the Marines being stuck with the last of the M103 super heavy tanks, which didn't really go with expeditionary warfare. No, <laughs> no, because uh, ships don't carry he- super heavy tanks very well, but. Um, that's what they did. So that's why the, the one of the reasons why the main battle the, the M60 was the, one of the first main battle tanks because they got rid of the idea of medium tanks and the super heavies uh, with the last Marine heavy tank battalion being retired in '63. Mm. Now let's quickly go through the wars this one's fought in. Uh, Cold War doesn't does that really count as a war? That was, it was built for it, yeah. <laughs> but then, okay. luckily, we're all happy that there was no direct conflict. Yeah, the- now the particular tank conflict. Um, it, the first war it saw real service was Yom Kippur, which in many ways was you know the last great tank war. Um, which um, yeah, and one thing they discovered in a big way, which drove a lot of other things we're going to get to is that anti-tank missiles really made a mess of steel hulled yep. um, tanks. That's where they started building composite uh, yeah. armour hulls. And, and explosive reactive armour and, and, and all those sorts of things. Um, but it was also a war, particularly in the Golan Heights, where um, tanks with good gun elevation just monstered Soviet tanks that couldn't just couldn't fire back from yeah. um, the bottom of a ridge. Yeah, or even sit at the bottom and you can shoot things coming down because they can't deep rest now yeah. low enough to, <laughs> to get to you. So. Yep. Um, the Ogaden War. Ouagadougou? What? A, the, the Ogaden War. Where's that? Yeah. Um, it's uh, not to be confused with the insurgency in Ogaden. Um, it's the Ethio-Somali War of right, um, yes. 1977. So, um... I'm sure we'll talk, we're probably talking about those with T-34s running around last mm, time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, now the invasion of Granada. Yes. Um, again, the Marines, um... Rolling it out there to save the 
governor, or whatever he was. Yeah, I mean... Ambassador, and his wife and his nine aides. Granada was basically the whole might of the US military against a cranky Russian construction battalion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was Ronnie Reagan's one real <laughs> shooting match. Yeah. Uh, Clint and, Eastwood got a uh, bit of a movie out of it. Yeah, and of course it was the war where they... Um, it, uh, the sovereign of Granada at the time was uh, Queen Elizabeth II, who woke up to discover her territory was being invaded by the US. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> moving on from that one, uh, the Persian Gulf War. Now, um, we're talking about the Iranian-Iraqi um, one and then the Iran-Iraq War. The Lebanese Civil War, the Israelis were using them very heavily. The 1982 Lebanon War, lots of people were using them by then. Yep. Uh, <laughs> the multinational force in Lebanon, the Yemeni civil war of 1994, oh, that would have been the Saudis uh, using them there. Uh, the Western Sahara war, um, the 2011 Bahrain protests, you know, um, it's always bad news when the other side brings a tank to a protest. Yeah. Uh, the Houthi insurgency in Yemen, which is ongoing, again, the Saudi ones. Yeah. Saudis uh, have a number or the, are in the process of replacing them, but they had it. Well, they still have hundreds, though. Yeah, be a still long time. using them. And I mean, the Saudis, you know, don't use, it doesn't matter what tank they've got, they won't use it well. <laughs> um... Yeah, just park it out on its own and wait for someone to bring the heavy weapons up onto it. Uh, the Kurdish-Turkish conflict uh, still ongoing. The Cambodian-Thai border dispute. The Turkish military intervention in the Syrian civil war, which is possibly the lead, world's leading um, generator of YouTube videos of M60s being blown up by <laughs> um, handheld um, missiles. Uh, the Sinai insurgency, the Yemeni civil war, and another Saudi Arabian-led intervention in Yemen. So the Yemenis certainly have gotten to know them well. <laughs> um, built, of course, by Chrysler Defense Engineering at um, the Delaware Defense Plant and the Detroit Arsenal Tank Plant. Yeah, I couldn't find references to other countries building it under license, except for the Italians mm. back in the 70s. Uh, and they gave all theirs to the Ethiopians and the Afghanis, I think, mm. uh, after they were done. So Yeah, uh, Leonardo Corp, which is an Italian um, defense conglomerate, do have a competing service life extension program. Um, so the, the SLEP programs are still rolling out around the world for the ongoing users. Mm. Um, and the big thing is they're putting the 120 millimeter Rhine yeah, metal. Yeah, so even um, the, the Turkish are getting the Israelis to put the 120 mil Rhine metal uh, barrel on for them because mm. uh, they've got 700 something or other, 900. Yeah, yeah. and I've got to say the, the stupidest thing in the world of tanks is um, composite applique armour put onto an M60. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of it, no. but you've, you've got a tank that was boxy but curvy, then having even boxier, non-curvy applique armour bolted on top. So it's this incredibly oversized monstrosity with these weird mm. panels sticking out at jaggy angles. Yeah. As uh, I was saying before, it's the new versions will have the should have the ERA uh, strapped onto the outside, which came into service with the A3 version in 83. Yeah. Which is basically the lessons of Yom Kippur, um, saying, hmm, got to do something to stop those anti-tank missiles coming in. Yes. So, uh, it, yep. was, it was designed, basically, to fight the Cold War. So, it was stationed in... Full to gap! Full to gap. <laughs> because, interestingly enough, it didn't go to Vietnam. The only ones... Yeah, they did. No, only no. the specialist vehicles went to Vietnam. Oh, okay. Or the, the, they said, you know what? We can't take them out of Western Europe in case the Russians come through. So okay. we're going to deploy the M48s to to Vietnam. They also were lighter. The you weren't having tank on a lot of tank on tank action. So therefore, mm -hmm. uh, the ninety mil gun of the M48s was good enough for jungle warfare. And also, it's just a sm slightly smaller tank, so it was better for m maneuverability within those environments. Yeah, uh, I mean, one thing I would say, if you're playing Tank ID, um, some of the distinguishing features of the M60, uh, prior to the arrival of night vision gear and being upgraded for night vision, is a lot of them had an enormous um, searchlight mounted over the main barrel, um, which if you actually look closely, even the ones that don't have the searchlight, they've still got the mounting points for a um, really big searchlight. Um in keeping, I think, with the M48s, there's very distinctive exhaust ports um, at the back. They look like something out of Robotech. Um, <laughs> yeah, very futuristic. I like them. Um, that's probably the, the big things. Um, so other things on the vehicle, uh, you got the 750 horsepower diesel. You got a 30 mil, uh, 
uh, 30 caliber coax uh, beside the barrel, but you also had a 50 cal in the Coppola. The Coppola is worth mentioning. That was yes. the thing to because it's possibly the most beautifully designed um, Coppola in the history of tanks, and it's almost the size of the turret. Yes, it's a uh, great it's, big thing <laughs> sitting up there, and the, the it was all designed to have this M50, uh, sorry, 50 cal inserted in, in the turret mm. uh, rather than having a pintle mounted mm. 50 cal on the outside where you can get shot at uh, while you're trying to use that. Mm. Um, and so the commander who could use the 50 cal from inside without with his hatch down, but of course it's now st- pretty uh, static within the cupola. And while he could turn around, there was no ability for anti aircraft of using this. Not that it would probably do a lot, but yes, it uh, was that was uh, they were trying to tick the boxes and saying it does have anti aircraft capabilities by having a 50 cal on the outside. I but think, I think really, back, realistically, there was nothing there for it. Yeah, I think back in the day of say when the day being 1943. Yeah. Um, being able to dack back with a 50 caliber, someone trying to line you up for a strafing run had some deterrent value. Um, by, you know, certainly by 1990, where the the greatest threat to tanks was an F-111 dropping a, gu- a laser-guided missile from miles away, mm. um, you're not going to defend yourself with, um, no. you know, with a 50 cal. Um, although helicopters being able to shoot back at probably had some merit. Mm. Um, the... A3 version came out, that came out in the 80s also had the smoke launchers um, added to it, whereas previously they hadn't, even though the Russians had had the smoke launchers on for quite a while. Hmm. Shall we make this the moment where we speak of the Starship? I think we have to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So while we've spoken of the M60, the M60A1, which is the one a lot of saw a lot of service, and then the A3, which was the later much better version, the A2, the mm. Starship, Again, never actually called the Starship in any sort of doctrine, but that's just the name it's become to be known by. Yeah. Now, of course, um, my uh, partner is um, called Sheridan, and um, on the first <laughs> the first day I met her, I did actually say, do you know you're named after a tank? <laughs> and she looked at me like I was quite the weirdo and said, what the hell are you talking about? Um, so the reason I bring up the Sheridan tank is that, um, the, um, Starship has the 152 mil mil gun. And, and it was because of this design idea, particularly after Yom Kippur, when they're like, wow, anti-tank missiles are the way forward. And before composite armor came along and, and basically killed off the effectiveness of anti-tank missiles. Um, you had this moment where they said, you know what the future is? It's a short-barreled, low-velocity uh, gun that can fire a really big, um, high-explosive shell. Or a missile. And it can fire... It's big enough to, to fit a missile down, down the tube, and that'll give you a 3,500-yard range. Um, you know, and, and it'll be a great big anti-tank missile. It'll go straight through the steel armour of our enemies. And it'll um, have lots of technology in there and radars yeah. and all sorts of exciting yeah. bits of gadgets and lights and switches and dials. It was just weird how this one moment from 1977 to around 1985, I guess, um, this was going to be the future, and then it suddenly wasn't the future. It was a complete dead end. But they did make 500 of them. Yeah, fi- well, 500 of the... Um, starships. Of the, yeah, M60 um, A2 starships um, with this stumpy gun that fired a missile, and, and there was a problem, the Shalady missile. For a while, the US Army tried to go all in. Every single vehicle was meant to fire Shalady missiles. Um, and then they discovered that particularly in, in the turret mount, the missiles, every time you fired the main gun as a gun, it was damaging the electronics on the missiles. Um, so then they were unusable, um, which which is a bit of a problem. Uh, and also just all of the, basically the fire control, the electronics was just ahead of its time and not reliable or rugged enough. And they didn't have the technicians to maintain them. And and they all, didn't yeah. have the spare parts in the logistics train. Um, it was all not working. That's yeah, pretty much where it ended up. Yeah, and the A twos were eventually retarded back to um, A three spec, I believe. Yep, or given over to other people to turn them into specialist vehicles. So the bridge layers, the mine clearers, the everything that doesn't re- have a gun in the turret and required to go into combat. Mm. Now, other problems with the Shalali missile that uh, I'm just noting here was that, um, as was very common with systems at the time, the gunner had to keep the target in the, gro- in the crosshairs during the entire flight time of the missile. 
Um, so you better not be moving if you're trying to do that. Uh, not only that, but the target better not be, <laughs> be moving. <laughs> um, and of this course, before before the game days of uh, everybody having a video game that uh, they learn how to do that sort of stuff, I guess as well. So yeah, but but also you got the problem that um, the missile is just giving away your position, and um, you have to sit there um, waiting and hoping that no one is um, sending fire back your way. Um, I mean, it should be it's a relatively short flight time, but I, every second feels like a lifetime. <laughs> I'm waiting for something to come back. Yeah. yeah. Other things uh, are, one of my favorite bits, mm-hmm. did have a tank telephone. In fact, I found a lovely little note in it saying, because it had a tank telephone, the first, the Marine Abrams upgrades also had the tank telephone. And since then, all Abrams have got the tank telephone. Well, the Tusk talk. upgrade uh, to Abrams put the telephone back on because, uh, yeah, it was one of those very disappointing moments where, hooray, we've got the new tank. It's got the latest and greatest. And um, <laughs> someone goes up to use the telephone to talk to the tank crew and they say, where's it gone? <laughs> <laughs> so the Marines had it, had it on theirs because they, yeah, obviously, uh, mm. but uh, uh, the M60 also had it on standalone. Uh, on it on the outside of its hull mm. uh the other um design feature that because uh, again this was in many ways an end point of a certain type of tank design and as is usually the way with end points um oh, there's a lot of really good things about them that you miss out on in the new generation uh it also had a hatch in the belly um, which was all, standard for the older tanks yes. because you wanted to be able to run away from your tank if it was uh, under heavy fire or anything whereas yes. the newer tanks well, it's a problem for mines. Hmm. Uh, the, it's a huge weakness, um, which is why they deleted it from the uh, M1. But uh, amongst many things, there is um, the whole, have I driven my tank into a ditch? Let's exit the tank through the belly hatch. Um, you know, have we been blown up and the turret is blocking the hatches? Let's exit through the belly hatch. Or if I flip the tank. Yeah. Um, and the other one is, that was uh, much missed as well for the infantry support role is someone is wounded, we will drive the tank over the top of them and um, pull them up into the um, tank through the belly hatch. Um, it was was used for um, injured soldier extraction and suddenly they could no longer do that. Mm. Um, so, um, yes, the, uh, lots of things that were greatly missed. Um, now, part of uh, keep going back. I want to keep going back to the Cold War, and sure. the, this tank was built to fight the Cold War. Mm-hmm. That was its purpose. That's why they um, had fifteen thousand of them made. Mm-hmm. Now, at the time, the Russians had the T fifty fives and the T sixty twos, but they also had their specialist T sixty fours come out. Now, this is the upgraded version of the Russian tanks, mm. and it was so it was in their guards. So, T sixty four was a guards unit yep. uh, tank. Yeah, yeah, and. When you put them head to head, I'd like to uh, you say to yourself that the T sixty four was a better tank than the M sixty, and what would have if the Cold War had ever kicked off, where that would have ended up. But then again, the Russians couldn't afford to build as many T sixty fours as they would like, which is why they then ended up going the T seventy two route, which was cheaper, a little bit less capable than the T sixty four. So it's interesting areas there of the. Americans stuck with the M60 and just did certain upgrades while the Russians would go through, because they were going for mass numbers, would have lots of different designs of tanks coming out in order to try and achieve their ends. Yeah, it really does go against what we... Most of what we commonly think about Soviet equipment is coloured by Western biases. Um, But, you know, the idea that the Americans had, here is the tank, this is the one tank, we all have the same tank... Versus the Russians with lots of different tanks coming out of lots of different design bureaus. And some of them are the elite tank for the elite units. Um, and also that the elite units get paid significantly more. I think it's something like three times the wages of the, um, the non-guards units. Um, which um, sounds like quite a capitalist sort of uh, incentive structure. <laughs> but uh... <laughs> Well, I guess with the conscription ideas of... You... And the levels of education you would have had uh, to be working with, uh, it's probably not a bad idea to... Yeah, I mean, through a lot of the Cold War, um, conscription was a big part of, part of the um, US Army as well, though. True, true, yep. Um, they, all those tanks in uh, Europe had to be manned by somebody. Yeah. <laughs> the Coppola also had a few other issues with it, and that um, once it was open, it was locked open and the hat with the hatch to the rear. So if you wanted to shut it and you were under fire... You had to stick your hand up. Not only you had to fire. stick your hand up, you had to 
stick your hand up and get into a strong position to be able to unlock it. So mm. realistically, you had to climb halfway out to be able to apply enough pressure to the locking device to then close the ha- close the hatch, at which point you're halfway out yeah. and getting shot at. So yeah. not a great. <coughs> Whereas the Russians overcame this by just having their hatches open to the front without a cupola. So yeah, I mean it's it's um, it's we could talk for a long time on um, commander's hatch design, um, and you know as we know from our conversation with the tank commander a few months ago, um, in a fight. You should not be up. sticking your head out out no, of the tank anyway, up. unless you yeah. want to make a martyr of yourself. Yeah. Um, but um, you've got this issue that if you have the um, the hatch opening forward, then the commander's protected um, by the hatch when he's if he is poking his head out from fire to the front. Um, but if you're in an insurgent situation um, going through a town, you might well be um, your back is now desperately unprotected. Uh, whereas if it um, as with the M60 with the hatch um, opening, so it's open. Behind you. Behind you. You're still um, looking towards the enemy. You're looking towards the enemy. And you have protection to your rear. Yeah. All right. Yeah, okay. um, I mean, the Kampala, the Kampala actually did allow them to have 360 uh, degree vision and uh, one set of binoculars in the um, yeah, in the Kampala. I mean, it was, so, a, it was a ludicrously oversized Kampala, but it was hmm. beautiful in that it had all these nine removable um, vision um, prisms um, and um, you could... Um, Re- replace them with your binoculars or your night vision hmm. um, for the one you're looking most through. But they were also overlapping so that even if one was hit, the you still had the other two on either side would give you um, a complete view. Hmm. Um, so, I mean, someone... So there was no blind spots in Yeah. So, someone spent an enormous amount of time designing this stupid couple. <laughs> <laughs> one thing we haven't spoken about is it's got a four-person crew. So yes. you got the driver in the which, hull, which we now think of as what a tank should have, but it took the <laughs> Americans a long time to get there. Yeah. So you got the driver in the central in the hull. Uh, when the turret is moving, they basically they're stuck in there. And they're not getting out. That's why they've got they're the ones with the belly hatch. So it's also for the driver's escape, uh, escaping if the turret is turned such a way that they cannot climb or open there. If they're buttoned up, they cannot climb out because the uh, turret is right above them. You've got the commander and the gunner on the right-hand side, uh, so just to be different from everybody else, um, because why not? Um, and then you've got the loader on the left. Hmm. Now, I just want to quickly go through the um, current operators of the M60 tank. So Afghanistan has 63 of them. Um, they were donated... In t- by the Greeks? Yeah, donated by the Greeks in 2009. Um, all are kept in reserve. So even if the, even the Afghans aren't super keen on their, their donor tanks from Greece, uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina have forty five of them. Um, they did were did set- we say the other week that they still had some T thirty fours in action as well? I think they're just taking yeah, everything, anything yeah. they can get. Yeah. yeah, these were transferred from the US in nineteen ninety six. Um, Bahrain has one hundred and eighty of them. Brazil has ninety one. Egypt sixteen hundred. Mm-hmm. Um, oh, that's just the um, M sixty A three, so it's the good final version. With, with the Brazilian ones, they they had a bit of unfortunate uh, situations in the nineties where they were building their own homegrown tank to compete with the M one Abrams on foreign sales, mm. and actually did much better than the Abrams in certain tank trials in in the Saudi Arabia. But well, the, the engine is just so much easier to maintain. But the problem was that uh, the Yanks decided, well, we've got to force you out of the market and mm. basically just flooded everybody, basically bought off the uh, the buyers to mm. make sure that the Abrams was purchased mm. and the poor Brazilians went, oh, we can't afford to keep going in this and got forced out of the market, uh, the tank export market and only had the five <laughs> versions, uh, five prototypes built and then had to go off and buy uh, the M60s. Now, just getting back to Egypt, um, 1,600 of the M60A3s, but also 700 of the M60A1. Um, now, apparently about half of those are in storage. Uh, Iran had 460 of the buggers, um, and 150, I believe, to still be in service. Uh, Israel has 111 um, of what they call the Magark 7C uh, in reserve storage, and um, a bunch of the uh, engineering vehicles are still in use. Um, Jordan um, has a substantial fleet. Lebanon has its own fleet. The Jordanians have also gone for the 120 mil um, upgrade. Yep, yeah, which also comes with a much bigger engine that throws out 950 horsepower. Um, 
and a whole bunch of basically retrofitting um, M1 Abrams stuff back into it. Uh, Morocco has a lot. Amman has over a hundred. Saudi Arabia has nearly a thousand. Um, Spain, Spain has quite a lot. Mm. Hmm. Uh, Sudan. The Spanish, the Spanish Marines have, mm. uh, have been been using those. Yeah, right. Okay. Sudan. Now, that, that's not the country you'd think of as a big tank operator, but there we go. They have 20 that they received in 1979 and they remain in service. Um, we mentioned the Taiwanese. They have 400 of the M60A3s with the TTS upgrade, which was um, a, a later Vision. one. Yeah. Um, and um, apparently 400 of the CM11 Brave Tigers, also based on the M60. Okay, so Rob, it's time for... Beer Review! Beer Review! What have we got today? It's called Little Guatemala. It mm. is a reasonably thick late 90s inspired imperial stout aged on cacao nibs and coffee beans from the Fontaflora Brewery in Nebo, North Carolina. Yeah, a lovely part of the world. And I just want to say a big shout out to our friends in Columbus, Ohio as well, who are the Thank most, you, Columbus. The, the, the leading source of our listenership at the moment. So um, thank, thank you, Columbus. We're not sure why you're listening. Um, but if you want to leave a comment somewhere and um, let us know, we'd be uh, fascinated to... Uh, See where our listeners come from. To build that bond. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, aged on um, cacao nibs and coffee beans. So and you can taste it. You can. Um, the whole thing with aging on those, like when you put it in the brew, um, it's obviously a, at a high temperature and it extracts a different flavor range. Whereas if you just put the cold beer on top of something and leave it for you know, a year, it's an imperial stout. So is it an imperial stout? Yes, it it's is. an imperial stout. So I think that means it's been aged a year. Um, could be wrong on that. Anyway, it's been aged on the things, but it's like a cold brew. So it doesn't extract um, a, a, a whole bunch of the flavors that you'd normally need heat for. Um, but they definitely do still come through in a big way. And and they have so they have. Um, it's got a huge amount of flavor. I'm not I'm not sure I can um, h- how much how well I'll do with this flavor. It's so strong. <laughs> this is this doesn't have any of the sweetness of other uh, stouts we've had. It's um it's just a big coffee and uh, cacao. Yeah, when they call it Guatemala, they're not they're not joking. Mm. Um, it really does taste like a fizzy coffee. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, like a, a good fizzy coffee, not a bad one. That mm. um, mm. that's dark. It's dark. Um, eight and a half percent. It's a um, uh, well, I'm assuming three thirty mil can, twelve fluid ounces. What's that? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Looks like a three thirty mil can yeah, to me. It does. Um, <laughs> and uh, I mean, yeah, a nice colourful can. It's a um, some sort of it's a label uh, wrapped around a um, raw aluminium can, which is a nice way of doing small batch um, brewing. I've always been a big fan of that, actually. Now I'm assuming the it's got a uh, the title is a little Guatemala, and it's got a school bu- an American school bus on it, which I'm in assuming I'm assuming is Guatemalan co- colours. It looks uh, like Guatemalan colours. Yes. So red, blue, yellow, mm. and green with a mm. few black stripes or something. So yeah. Go. So I'm assuming that comes from the cacao. I'm assuming the cacao and the coffee, coffee. are both from Guatemala. Yeah. I would hope so, uh, if you're going to take their name. Mm. Nice warning from the Surgeon General. We don't normally get those in Australia. We have our own health warnings, of course. Um, yeah, look, this is... If you're really after a stout, which, you know, um, I th- for the beer education of our non-beer drinking listeners, which we have some, it's a thick, dark, black um, beer. Guinness is the most famous example, although Guinness... Is a pretty mediocre stout in the the world of stouts. Yes. Um, now, this is, the more t- I drink of it, this this is technically an excellent stout. It's just it's so thick and heavy and mm. full of flavour that I am going to drink one and and I don't feel an enormous need to <laughs> go no. out and ever get another one. No. Um, I'm sure now, there'll be one night I'm in a pub and it'll seem like a good idea, but it probably won't be. I'll be wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, 11 bucks a can from Plonk. That's pretty reasonable for a beer. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, it's got some uh, gravitas to it, I'll say. That's for sure. Um, Gravity, be- I mean, it's 8.5% as well. So, you know, this podcast is probably going to go downhill from here, but um, <laughs> it was probably going that way anyway. 
Now, I've just remembered uh, the reason why I decided on this one is because it was supposed to be minus 5 to 12 degrees here in Canberra today, the coldest day of the year so far. And I thought, right, what we need for that is a nice big uh, stout to, to warm our bones. But uh, it's actually, well, a very frosty morning. Uh, it's and it's act- a whole 10 degrees in the hot, warmest part of the day right now. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> in the sun, it was actually quite a beautiful sunny day, mm. if cold and just mm-hmm. don't want to be hanging out in the shade too long. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but still, I mean, this is the time to drink these dark beers is, yes. is when the weather is cooler. You certainly don't want it on a 40 degree day. Now, big news in the world of tanks. What's happened, Rob? The Challenger 3 has been announced. Now, this is such big news that our fandom has actually been messaging us all week <laughs> saying, oh my God, have you seen Challenger 3 has been announced? Uh, and I have to say... This is the stupidest decision I can recall in... And the world of defence procurement is littered with stupid decisions or decisions that are really good for someone to make a lot of money and really bad for national defence and taxpayers and people have to serve in the machines. And this is... I'm sure someone's making a mozza, but this is staggeringly dumb from the United Kingdom. So they're building... How many, Rob? 148. 148. Of because an, that's all you need to defend England. Of an orphan bugger fleet. The, bugger the Wales, Welsh and the, uh, and, the, and the Scots. Yeah. Now, this is a tank fleet roughly the same size as the Australian tank fleet. Yep. But we use the M1s so that we're part of a world of um, spare parts and training and doctrine and manuals. Whereas, But, but they're going to... Buy, uh, buy British is what they're doing. Well, they're not, because they're buying from Rheinmetall BAE <laughs> Systems, which is a German company functionally anyway. Uh, Based in <laughs> England. Yeah, they're going to build them in you know, somewhere in England. Um, so the big thing is it's a whole new set of electronics, which they literally... There's just, a man just that, did on they the put a man too. onto their TV feed saying, oh, it's got technology like you'll find in your mobile phone. I'll be like... Yeah, great. That's that's fantastic. Spend hundreds of millions on something you can get in an iPad. You know. Six hundred dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it's it, you know it's like oh, this will give us um, you know networking that previously the information had to go back to divisional headquarters, and it's like, well, it means you've got data flying over your battlefield, but no one's assessing the value of it. Um, so 120 mil smoothbore cannon, which they should have built in Challenger 2. Hmm. Um, they you... So they finally gotten away from their... Uh, the uh, rifled ammo. The rifled ammo. So they can yeah. actually use everybody else's ammo and they're not beholden upon the... It was the... the weird Belgian company that made the last 120 mil rifle ammunition in the world. Uh, I mean, they you know they had a problem in that they came out of the Cold War with a huge stockpile of um, rifled ammunition that they wanted to um, you know, well, let age out gracefully, I guess. They did use a fair bit in the Gulf War, to be fair, um, and Afghanistan. But so <laughs> you've you've got a a an, a new supposedly tank um, that no one else will use, and that um, simply because they refuse to buy a German tank. Yep, and they're probably not going to sell them to anybody else either. I mean, well, who's going to buy it? Yeah, I mean, even though they'll be saying to themselves, "Oh, we'll get ex- export markets for these." Tell me, has anybody besides Jordan got Challenger twos? Yeah, and they didn't buy it because they thought it was a good tank. They bought it for all sorts of other political mm. reasons. Yeah, uh, those, monarch- I mean, those absolute monarchies got to st- stick together, don't they? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, seriously, yeah, there are reasons why they should have gone with um, Abrams in terms of commonality, and you know, particularly given you've got U.S. Marine Corps F thirty fives flying off the um, Queen Elizabeth right now. Um, Main thing is they weren't going to go French. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not saying they should have gone French, I, I, but I think even the French will probably go with um, Leopard 2 on their next generation. Um, I could be proved wrong I, that. No, but, I think the the French the French nationalism will maintain itself and... Well, with they'll, with they'll another keep, stupid tank purchasing decision. Yeah, yeah. they're going to they're keep building French, but it's mm-hmm. why they... Their, their support for NATO and everything else has always been a case of, well, we'd rather have our own indigenous um, uh, systems and military that's not reliant upon other things because as a colonial power, they still have to deploy things all yeah. around the world without support from NATO, UN or anybody else so they can fight their, on their territories against whatever insurgents might be occurring. Yeah, but I mean, it's funny because this is theoretically the M60 episode. But this decision that the British have made is finally giving them the capability that the M60 also has to mount the um, 120mm smoothbore gun. <laughs> um, granted, the Challenger's armour is significantly better than an M60's. Mm. Um, but the thing is, if you are going to have a significant tank core, 
then you can make an argument for an indigenous um, tank. Hmm. Right, so if the French are going to build 2,000 um, tanks to equip their army, then you, the, the economies of scale and the value of local production starts to make some sort of sense to build your own design, particularly if you have requirements that no one else has. Um, you know, uh, yeah, Australia is an you know, interesting case. All our armoured vehicles carry a lot more water than other people's because of um, the fact we have a very dry environment. Hmm. Um, it's just... It's, it, it's protectionism. It's... Um, it it, it, it racks of, reeks of defence industry corruption. Boris um, would never do that. Yeah, but when Boris would never be involved in a dodgy deal. Uh, Bo- Boris Johnson in a dodgy deal, you say, My sir. goodness, no. No, say it isn't so, John. Yeah, uh, and obviously there's, there's a bit of patriotism and, and, and nationalism, but um, for a fleet this small of a bespoke orphan tank, I, I just... It, boggles the mind and i get this british pride and in particularly the british pride meant that um they felt the the excuse is given that the, the nation that invented the tank could never buy a german tank it's like <laughs> but your politicians are all driving in german cars <laughs> now alongside this it was the interesting news that australia our own country has decided to go out and buy the m1a2s now so we've been driving around the last uh, 15, 16, 20 years, whatever it is, in the M1A1, Abrams. Mm-hmm. And we, now- we literally built a transcontinental railway road that serves no national purpose other than transporting our tanks to the Northern Territory. There's five people, like, going up and down the GAN. And there's, <laughs> and there's, the, YouTube, there's the GAN YouTube station where you yeah, can just sit there and watch, slow the, TV. Yeah. <laughs> watch the train go up and down but the, the 2,000 the, kilometres worth of desert. The main reason that we bridged 40 major rivers for this rail line was solely so that we could get our tanks from our um, tank training ground to the Northern Territory. Which is about two and a half thousand kilometres, maybe a bit more, I don't yeah. know. Um, you know, and I mean, Australia's tank fleet has always been as much a capability retention uh, force as an actual uh, warfighting force. And and that's not a criticism. Capability retention in complex mm. warfighting is unbelievably important. Uh, and if you've got a, a hundred tanks and the, the maintenance crews and the training facilities, then you have the potential to expand as needed. Hmm. Um, but they're not kind of deployable because if we deploy them somewhere, then we won't have any if we need them at home for whatever reason. Well, I don't know why we'd need them at home. And I, yeah. <laughs> uh, look, I, I suspect... So we're buying, buying a 75 and they're just going to be replacements for the M1A ones. Yeah, but we've so also bought six of the engineering versions, which I think there's only like 30 in existence. So a significant proportion will um, be on our shores. Um, I... I fear, and you know, we, we're venturing into modern geopolitics here. Um, certainly, everyone looks like they're getting ready to fight a um, a war over Taiwan quite soon. Um, as with most wars, uh, it's probably a really bad idea. Um, but um, you know, Taiwan or, or Myanmar? I can't see us fighting over Myanmar. No, I. I mean, in, the, the in t- terms of if if that war starts. My understanding from you know very high, you know, entirely public sources is that uh, you know Australia's obligation is going to be to tie down the um, Bay of Bengal with an anti-submarine force, which we have the equipment for, and it should keep us out of the shooting. And that's not a bad uh, way to spend a war, bobbing around in the Bay of Bengal, um, <laughs> chasing submarines that aren't there. Mm-hmm. Um, but you know, I, to the extent that this little tank podcast has any say in world affairs, which is None whatsoever, <laughs> but also to the extent that the Australian government has any say in these affairs, no. which is equally none. Um, you know, I um, hope that. Um, but being in Canberra, John, we do have access to the corridors of power. <sighs> well, we can we can see the windows of the corridors of power. Um, yeah, it's I, I I have no enthusiasm um, for this conflict, partly because there won't be a major a good tank component. <laughs> Um, but I don't also, think it'd be a bad outcome for everybody involved. If you can just go to the table and start talking, everybody will be ha- much happier. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the winners of, of of any war is the country that managed to stay out of it. Um, obviously, sometimes you don't have a choice, which is why we need um, a defence establishment. Um, but uh, yes, Australia has bought, uh, for us, an enormous number of tanks. It almost doubles our um, tank force. Uh, as I said, I think it's more to do being a replacement. Yeah, that's not changing the, the, mm. the final size, although sometimes when you've got them coming in and you haven't released the other ones, you can... 
hold on to them. They're, they're the training versions. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, good that we're finally getting the upgrade. I there's always issues. We don't use the depleted uranium, so our armor is not as good. Um, and then that's the extent to which we're actually we're getting an export version or the proper version. But that's for other people to figure out. Uh, cool. Well, we've gone on for nearly an hour. Um, and some of that was even about the M60. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which... I feel like we could have talked more on it, but then you just sort of... It's, it's very easy to gloss over large sections of it, so... As I said, I think it all comes down to the fact that they built it to fight the Cold War that never happened, so it was just stayed on the front... on those um, front lines in West Western Europe... And waited for something to happen. Waited for something to happen. Never really did. And uh, the French and the uh, and the British and also the, and the Russians went off to fight all the little bush wars around the other place during those fifty years that it was deployed on the in Western Europe. Yeah, uh, I mean, it was produced in enormous numbers. Fifteen thousand mm. um, tanks makes it one of the the most produced tanks uh, ever. Um, just was in, in a weird way, like it didn't have an enormous amount of armor. It had enough armor to keep out small arms and other light vehicles, but it was in desperate trouble if it got shot at by a um, by another real tank. Mm. It was in desperate trouble if it got shot at, shot at with an anti tank missile because it was homogenous steel armor, which those things are just designed to um, Go, launch do, straight through or do bad things on the inside. You also. know, the, the hundred and five millimeter gun was okay, but not stellar. Uh, you know, for the era, and that the Russians had much bigger guns. Yeah, the r- r- Russians running around with one twenty-five mil guns. Yeah, yeah. Um, it had a reliable engine, which is uh, you know an understated thing, but incredibly important. It produced enough power. It wasn't a fast tank by any means, though. Nope. Um, it had you know it was very boxy. It had high clearances. It had that you know because it was the last generation of steel tank, and a bit like Chieftain, which was in its case the last generation of steel tank. All sorts of beautiful curves and almost like a boat-like shape to the hull and things like that. But, uh, um, you know, a- again, a um, an end of the road for design because um, new technology was rendering all of that um, obsolete. Um, and then you have the Starship, which for a brief window was a solution to a problem that ceased to exist. Um, yeah. Um, for such a uh, widely produced and um, important tank, there's weirdly little to say about it. But uh, anyway, we've had fun talking about it. We have. Um, thank you for listening. Uh, we're going to take you out with um, Etienne's um, second version of our um, theme music by Luke McGrath. Thank you, and, Etienne. Um, we will be back uh, next month with a with a new tank. Any any idea on the next tank, Rob? Oh, let's, let's try a Frenchie, eh? Let's try the Leclerc or something. Ooh. Oh. Okay, we're going, we're going with the French tanks. Again. I really like French beer. It'll be good. Okay. <laughs>